So we have started Unit 4 material and we begin with Chapter 9. So your textbook calls this crustal deformation and earthquakes, but I really think it's more accurate to call this chapter structural geology and earthquakes. So this first lecture will focus on structural geology, then you'll have an activity, and then um, you will be learning about earthquakes afterwards. You can definitely, um, there is a huge overlap between these two topics though. Um, however, I really think the physical features and the geophysical features are important to keep separate. So let's start with looking at this photograph. These are a bunch of sedimentary rock layers. And one of the things we learned is that sedimentary rock layers are deposited horizontally initially and things can happen to them afterwards. And we learned about that with the law of original horizontality. You can see that these rocks no longer follow that law, and that's because they've been deformed um, along a plate boundary. So when rocks get deformed, we're talking about a change, which is what this triangle means here, this delta. It means a change in the shape of a rock, so no longer being sort of flat or rectangular in shape. Uh, the size of the rock, sometimes rocks will be shortened, or the orientation of a rock, sometimes rocks will go from being horizontally deposited to being tilted. Most deformation occurs along plate boundaries as a result of tectonic forces. So that's actually what we're going to talk about next, is what are some of the forces or stresses that cause um, rocks to deform. So all deformation results from stress applied to rocks. In the next, in this slide, what you're going to see is changes to an undeformed cube of rock, which you see down here, and then here you see some undeformed strata or rock layers. We're going to talk about the different types of stresses that can be uh, applied to rocks and how they typically respond. The first type of stress that can be applied to rock is called a compressional stress. Compressional stress is the squeezing of rocks, which is what you see here. So our undeformed cube of rock was squished and you can see that it gets a little taller and it goes from being a cube to be sort of a rectangle. Um, but the force that's being exerted here is a squeezing where the, both sides are being compressed inward. That has different impacts on the undeformed strata. So sometimes you'll see that rocks will fold as a result of compressional stress, and we'll see that in just a few minutes. And sometimes rocks will fracture or fault, and that's where you see breakage in rocks. Those are different types of deformation, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, the other thing that's important to note is that compression is the type of stress that is exhibited at convergent plate boundaries. So we're going to connect here back to plate tectonics, which really is a big theme of all of this last unit, is the connection of the earth to plate tectonics and how it shapes the surface of the earth. So the next type of stress we're going to talk about is called tensional stress. Tensional stress is when rocks get stretched. It's when it gets thinned and lengthened. And we see that here in this block here. So I often tell students that tensional stress or extensional stress, if you want to think about it that way, um, is kind of like what happens if you have like a Charleston chew, which those are the candy bars that are like 12 inches long and they're a lot of taffy inside. And it takes a long time for a Charleston chew to break into two chunks. But what happens is when you pull it on either side, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner. Eventually it will break apart. But before that happens um, in rocks, we start to see fracturing and faulting here in the subsurface. Intentional stress is stress that is associated with divergent plate boundaries. And you can tell that by looking at the arrows here, right? The arrows are moving apart from one another. The third type of stress is called shear stress. Shear stress is when rocks slip past one another in opposite directions. Um, and Professor Barone often tells her students that this, these are like scissors moving in opposite directions. What you see is there's not really any folding and there's really only usually one or maybe at two major faults that form as a result of shear stress. Um, the rocks aren't tilted at all, but what does happen is right along the zone of maximum shear stress, what ends up happening is the rocks will very often become pulverized and, and kind of shatter. Um, shear stress is kind of like what if you had like a deck of cards in your hand and you moved one hand to the up and one hand down, that deformation that you'd see in that deck of cards is like shear stress. 
Um, shear stress is also what is typically associated with transform fault boundaries. Um, so these are different types of stress associated with plate boundaries, and they end up causing different sorts of deformation in rocks. So stress causes deformation, but deformation can differ um, in the way it's expressed. So this is a location in New York State. Um, it's a famous outcrop up near Governor, New York, near Watertown, and it's called the Snake. Um, and what you see in this picture is actually a bunch of dynamite holes because this is along a roadside and so there was dynamite applied here to kind of widen the road. Um, the other thing that probably catches your eye is this white band, this sinuous white band that looks so very snake-like. Um, and that is a, um, it is a metamorphosed volcanic ash bed, which is really cool. Um, and it was deposited on top of limestone that event when it metamorphosed turned into marble so this is marble with a metamorphosed ash bed um, and what you see here is that the marble and the volcanic ash have been really compressed over time you can really see like the squeezing of the terrain in the way in the orientation of the volcanic ash bed so this type of deformation is called ductile deformation there we go, ductile deformation. When you think of ductile or ductile, you wanna think of like wires, the way that oh, copper wire will bend, um, because that's what ductile deformation is. All of this deformation is occurring inside the earth. And what's happening is that rocks inside the earth are warmer, and they're also under some pressure. And so when they are squeezed, rocks will actually flow over very long periods of time. They behave almost like liquids over long periods of time. And so they show, they demonstrate flow very much like you might expect a liquid to. Um, so ductile deformation involves the bending of rocks. Um, and the opposite of that is brittle deformation. This is actually just a little bit down the road from the snake. Again, you see the, the um, dynamite marks. And there's my friend Lisa holding a rock hammer that's somewhere about 12 to 16 inches long. Um, and here's that beautiful white marble, which you can actually see the flow structure in really nicely. And then this is a basaltic dike. And this basalt, you can just see, broke apart into chunks. And this part here that Lisa's holding her rock hammer near used to fit really nicely in the corner right here. Um, so brittle deformation is not when rocks are bending like this, like this marble is, but when rocks are breaking apart like this basalt is. So rocks will break apart, they'll also fault. Um, and so those are examples of brittle deformation. There are different things that can cause rocks to either deform ductally or brittly. And here is a picture from Bighorn National Forest. These are a couple of my ridiculous students standing near evidence for both ductile and brittle deformation. You can probably see the evidence for the ductile deformation right here, right? So you can see that the rocks bent in this little area when it was compressed. What's harder to see is the brittle deformation. There's actually a fault that roughly cuts right down there. Um, and what your eye probably notices is all of this weathering here along this red portion of the rock. And what's happening is that groundwater from below is migrating up through the fault and reacting with iron rich rocks here to produce this weathering right along um, the fault and that's pretty fun. So that's an example of brittle deformation because the rocks are broken there. You can see that this rock layer doesn't match up to any rock layer on the other side here. And again, that's because it doesn't. The rock has, has shifted and um, this likely came from much further below. So let's get rid of my pointer. Um, what influences rock deformation is four main factors. And one is temperature. So is Think about this in terms of like candle wax. When candle wax gets warm, it's more likely to flow. And when that candle wax cools off, it's more likely to break. So when temperature goes up, rocks are more likely to exhibit ductile deformation or bend. And when rocks are cold, they tend to break or exhibit brittle deformation. So directly related to temperature is confining pressure. That is the pressure of all the overlying rocks on a particular rock layer. So as the pressure goes up, 
the temperature also goes up. And again, so when pressure goes up, rocks are more likely to bend. When the pressure starts to drop, they are more likely to break. We just saw on the last two slides, the basalt and the marble. And we saw that those rocks behaved very differently under the base, basically the same environmental conditions. So rock type can very much control whether a rock is likely to bend or that to break. Um, and that has to do with the mineral content within the rock. And the last thing is time. So think about yourself. The longer stress is applied to you, are you more li likely to bend to that stress or are you likely to break in response to that stress? Um, in general, <laughs> people respond to stress initially by bending and accommodating that stress and then eventually they get to a breaking point where they can no longer handle a certain level of stress. And that is the same way with rocks. So rocks will undergo a stress for some period of time, but eventually that amount of stress will exceed its sort of ductile limit and then a rock will bend only so long and then eventually it will break. So those are the four factors that influence deformation. We're going to look at some features that are common with ductile deformation and then with brittle deformation. And I'll also provide just a you might want to look through the slides here. Um, this particular unit it, in chapter, I think it's useful to have figures with you to kind of jot down notes, regardless of how you take notes. If you do it electronically, do it right on these slides. And if you do it, if you print off things, um, you definitely want to pay attention to um, the images in this particular chapter. They're super important. So ductile deformation, again, involves the bending of rocks, rocks that exhibit flow over time. And that's what you see in this picture. There are four main types of folds that we're going to talk about today. Um, and they have to do, again, with deformation that is the result of ductile, ductile deformation. So one type of rock is called an anticline. And you see that down here. Anticlines are up warping or up folded rocks. And I like to tell my students that they make the letter A. A for anticline. This is the result of compressional stress. So if you can kind of imagine a piece of paper, in fact, if you take a piece of paper in your hand and you push that piece of paper together, it will naturally form anticlines and what are called synclines, which are downfolds in rocks. Um, and so here is a syncline that you see here. And the syncline, I like to tell my students, makes a smile. Yay. So very frequently you will see anticlines and synclines it, one after another. So here you see anticline, syncline, anticline, syncline, anticline, syncline. Um, those are pretty typical, especially um, if you've ever driven down through Pennsylvania, through West Virginia, and parts of uh, Western Virginia, you've definitely driven up and down these valleys and ridges, and those exist because of anticlines and synclines in the subsurface. So anticlines and synclines are often described based on their parts. So if you were to slice an anticline in half, you would be along sort of its point of maximum curvature, you would be slicing along its axis. And then from its axis, there are two what are called limbs. So here's one limb to this anticline and here is the second limb. Okay, um, and then the, and the limbs are sort of bisected by the axis, which is right here. So the limbs are the tilted rock layers and the axis is the point of maximum curvature that kind of cuts the fold in half. Um, and when we look at anticlines, anticlines are oriented in such a way that the limbs dip away from the axis. So when I talk about dip, I like to, in my head, imagine that I pour a glass of water, for instance, on this yellow rock layer, and that water is gonna flow away from the axis because it just kind of flows down. it's dipping or tilted away from the axis same thing on this side um, this yellow rock layer is also dipping away from the axis so again imagine pouring yourself a glass of water here and watching that water flow away from the axis synclines are the opposite right so if you have a syncline like this and then here is your land surface let's say um, here would be your axis right through here so there's your axis and here your limbs are tilted toward your axis, right? 
because if we were to pour a glass of water right here, it would flow down those rock layers and toward the axis or the point of maximum curvature. So that's exciting. Um, here is a picture of some anticlines and synclines. So take a minute, find the anticline, find the syncline. So let's start with the anticline. So the axis of the, so the anticline is right here. I know you can't really see my mouse, but what I'm going to do is sketch in kind of the axis of the anticline right there. And so here is a limb. Choo. And then here is another limb, right, for the anticline. So that's cool. Um, and then the syncline, the axis of the syncline is right here, right? Because you see the syncline, whoops, I got a little, a little off course there. It should have gone this way. Um, so you can see the smile of the syncline, right? So what you'll notice is that the limb of this syncline is also the limb of the adjacent anticline here. So here's your axis and here's your limb. And then here is your second limb. Anticlines and synclines always have two limbs. Good stuff. So there's two more folds we have to talk about for ductile deformation. Oh, but first I have to show you this sweet, sweet fold. Um, this is right along the Pennsylvania, Maryland border. And we actually, I actually took this picture uh, when Barone and I got lost once we were driving back, we got quite lost indeed, um, driving across Pennsylvania and um, all of the routes kind of converged in one city. Um, and Barone was really mad at me because she was looking at me and she was pretty sure we were lost and I was pretty sure we were lost. I knew where we were, um, but she, we needed to get someplace fast and we were not able to. Um, but then I was saved because we found this super sweet syncline. So if you look here, sometimes students have a hard time identifying this, but here is the syncline that the road kind of cuts right through. It's really sweet. So there's two other folds. This one is called a dome. Um, so a dome, if we just look at the subsurface, it kind of looks like an anticline, right? Because you have upwarped rocks. But then you look on the surface and what you see is that the rocks on the surface form this circular outcrop pattern. So you probably see these little T symbols all over the place. These are actually called strike and dip, dip symbols. And the dip indicates the direction that the rocks are tilted. If you look around at these strike and dip symbols, what you'll see is that in all cases, the rocks are dipping away from the center of this circular feature. And what that tells us is that in all directions around this central point, rocks are dipping away. So what that means is you have the most uplifted part in the center, and then you have rocks that are dipping away from the center in all directions. So this structure is called a dome. Um, you can think of like the carrier dome or like the cap, the capital, um, the capital building in Washington DC is like a dome, um, where again, it's high in the middle and lower on the sides. And you can see that when you look at the rock layers, the oldest rock here, when we look at the rock layers that are exposed in cross section, the oldest rocks, are exposed in the center and the youngest rocks are exposed sort of on the flanks. So this is a dome. Again, it's an up warping of rock with a circular structure and the oldest are in the center and the youngest are on the flanks. The opposite of dome is called a basin. And you can see that superficially, if you look at the surface, it looks, it has that circular outcrop pattern. If you look at the subsurface, you see that it's down warped rocks. And the other thing you'll see is if you look at these strike and dip symbols, all of the rocks are dipping towards the center, not away. Um, and this is called a basin. And you can think about it like a wash basin um, where, or a bowl shaped feature where the lowest point is in the center and the um, highest points are on sort of the flanks. Um, this forms, basins often form between mountains or um, just at low points uh, between points of higher elevation where sediment will accumulate in these sort of curved layers. So when we think about domes and basins, we don't usually always associate uh, tectonic stresses with them. Sometimes they just form as a result of um, the actual current environment. 
um, sometimes they can form, especially with domes, for a variety of other reasons. But when you're looking at a basin, again, on the surface, if you're just looking at the rock layers exposed at the surface, you will see a circular structure in the surface. Um, and what's different here is that if we look at the age of the rocks in the cross section, right, you have the youngest in the center here. And then the oldest rocks exposed along the or the older rocks exposed along the flanks um, so that's a little bit opposite of your situation with a dome um, so just some fun things to keep in mind those are all evidence of ductile deformation so here is the state of michigan and this is a geologic map of michigan um, a geologic map is basically if you pulled off all of the surface features. So all of the soil, all of the building, certainly all of the vegetation, and you could just see the rock layers exposed. Um, this is the pattern you would see in Michigan. And what you hopefully can identify is this generally circular pattern of colors um, where you have, and then if we were to cut into the earth, from A to B here, right across the mitten of Michigan, and we were able to see inside the earth. This is what we would see. Um, so again, here it looks in the subsurface kind of like a syncline, but the circular pattern on the surface tells you it's not a syncline, it's actually a basin. And then just to confirm, if you look here, the rocks in the center of this basin are Upper Pennsylvanian, which are about oh, 300 ish million years old. And the rocks on the outside here, like this purple rock here, is Devonian in age. Um, so I said the Pennsylvania is about 300 million years old, actually, probably a little bit less. And the Devonian is like about 350 million years old. So once again, you have the younger rocks in the center and the older rocks on the flanks. You have a circular pattern and then in the subsurface, you can see this down warping. Cool. So those are all examples of ductal deformation. Brittle deformation is again when rocks break. And there's two types of things we're going to talk about in regards to uh, brittle deformation. We're going to talk about faults and we're going to talk about joints. So let's start, start with faults. Faults are where you have fractures in a rock and there has been measurable movement along either side of that fracture. This is the relatively famous Moab fault zone. This is located in Moab, Utah. And this is, I'm pretty sure we were actually right in the visitor center parking lot of Arches National Park. And my students were <laughs> being very whiny and very unpleasant the morning that, we, that this picture was taken and um, it was very hot and I made them sit on the ground and draw this fault zone and I told them it was gonna be worth a lot, their sketch was gonna be worth many, many points because I was feeling vindictive and powerful and abusive that morning, I guess. So I made them sketch the Moab fault zone which has over 20 faults in it. So hopefully if you look at this rock, you can see, I promise I'm not crazy um, or too crazy, but you can see fractures in the rock. And what's cool about the Moab fault zone is you can actually measure um, how rocks move along those fractures. So if you kind of look here at this base of this reddish purple layer, you can trace that here, and then you can trace it down to here. Um, and every single one of these little fracture, er, these cracks here is a fault. Um, so there's over 20 faults in the Moab fault zone. It's pretty, pretty cool. Um, you can see another cool one right here, in fact. So faults occur when there's fractures in rock where movement has taken place. It's sad that this figure is no longer used in textbooks, but is fantastic. This is such a 1980s geologist figure that I just wanted to bring it back. I don't care that this picture was in a textbook that's 15 years old. This picture is fantastic and is a really great picture of a fault also. Um, you can see the um, whole arrows have been added to this to kind of give you an idea of what's going on. But the fault is right along here. I just want everyone to take a minute and stare at this man's awesome, awesome, awesome outfit first. It's very distracting. Once you get past that, we can start talking about the fault. Um, so when you're trying to figure out how a fault has moved, you want to find some sort of indicator bed, some bed that's kind of unique. So let's look at this black layer here. And then that used to be 
at the same location. It whoops, is this black layer here. They used to be one continuous rock layer, but you can see now that they're offset, they're offset along this fault. So what's fun is kind of figuring out what happened here. So if we assume that this rock layer didn't move, but that this chunk did, then you can see that this black layer kind of slid down that way. And then if we assume that this part of the rock layer didn't move, but this part did, then you can see that it looks like this side of the fault got lifted up here. And that's the same thing we actually see in these arrows. Um, anytime you have a fault, you want to be able to kind of label the fault and uh, figure out what the motion is. And the reason you want to do that is because a fault is basically broken into two blocks. So we're going to talk about that on the next slide. Motion along faults actually ends up causing and being the cause of most earthquakes um, on the earth. So that's your connection between structural or crustal deformation and earthquakes. So that'll be our segue in just a bit in this class. So there are two main parts of the fault um, and they're actually were initially named by miners who went ahead and did a lot of mining along ore deposits found along faults. So as we saw in the picture from Bighorn National Forest, a lot of times water will move up through faults. Um, and in that situation, that water just caused kind of oxidation of the rocks with it had iron in within them. Uh, but other times there'll be water that will move along the faults and they will carry up lots of minerals in them. And those minerals, once they get away from like a magma chamber, for example, can cool and those minerals will form ore. Um, so miners then would find um, an ore seam or an ore vein at the surface and know that it extended downward through the earth along a fault. So they would mine from the surface and then kind of move their way down as they mined. Um, and if you can kind of imagine a miner walking down a fault as they mine down, your feet would go on what they call the foot wall. Um, Cause again, that's where they're right. This is where this man's feet is there. It's right here on the foot wall. And he would hang his lantern, um, not to assume the gender of miners, but historically they've mostly been men, um, and hang your lantern on what's called the hanging wall. So that's the top part of the fault. If you ever, identifying the hanging wall and the foot wall is super important. The hanging wall is the block of rock or the rock surface above the fault. So if you're ever like struggling, you can always do like a vertical line through the fault. And the top of the vertical line always goes into the hanging wall and the bottom of the line always goes into the foot wall. Now, obviously this is just an enlargement of this, so it has to be the same, but again, you could draw a little person along the fault. Their feet are on the foot wall and the top, their head would be near the hanging wall. So the foot wall is the rock surface below the fault. Um, so the reason that it's so important is that the behavior of the hanging wall tells you what type of fault it is, and that gives you a clue as to what sort of tectonic stress you're looking at also. So back to my old favorite, this picture. So here we have, again, our sweet, sweet fault. Right down there. And I got a little wavy in here, but it's relatively straight. Um, take a minute. See if you can identify the hanging wall. So again, draw your vertical line. The top of the vertical line goes through the hanging wall. The bottom goes through the foot wall. And again, if you were a little minor hiking down the fault, you would put your feet on the foot wall and your head would be on the hanging wall. Um, so again, this is the motion along the fault, right? Where in this situation, the hanging wall is sliding down and the foot wall is moving up. And this is called a normal fault. It's called a normal fault. If you've ever taken physics, um, which obviously you don't have to have taken physics, but there's something called the normal stress um, in physics. And it's just the downward stress. It's the stress due to gravity. And that's what the normal fault is where there's a fracture and the stuff that's on top or the hanging wall slides down under gravity. Um, it's indicative of tensional stress. So remember tensional stress, I'm really enjoying the pointer of this particular chapter, sorry. That's a divergent boundary, right? Because you have stretching of the crust to 
create some or is a result of divergence in the subsurface. If we were to look at this in like a cartoon, it would look like this. Again, vertical line, top is the hanging wall, bottom is the foot wall. And then when we find rock layers on either side, like this green layer, you can see that the green layer here slid down, the hanging wall slides down. And once again, hanging wall sliding down means that it is a normal fault. Good stuff. All right, the opposite of that is a reverse fault. And a reverse fault is instead of the hanging wall sliding down, you see here that the hanging wall is sliding up. And you can see that if you're looking just at these, this tan layer here, right? Um, that this, if we pretend that this tan layer hasn't moved, that one slid way up here. And if we pretend that this layer hasn't moved, then this one has slid way down here. So in addition to the hanging wall moving in opposite directions, the deformation or the stress is also opposite. So instead of stretching or extensional stress, this is actually compressional stress or squeezing. Um, and compressional stress or squeezing is, as you can see with the arrows here and here, as the result of a convergent boundary where rock layers are smashing together. Sweet. All right, and our last type of fault is actually called a strike slip fault. Ooh, and all the text popped right up here. <laughs> um, so here is the most famous strike slip fault in the land, and that is the San Andreas Fault, which cuts right through Southern California right here. Um, it's associated with shear stress, which again is when rocks are the fault is actually vertical here, so there is no hanging wall or foot wall, um, but they're moving in opposite directions. Um, and the San Andreas Fault is an example of what's called a right lateral strike slip fault. So imagine that you're here and you're looking across the fault to something here. And then there's an earthquake um, that, let's say you're looking at a rock, because why wouldn't you be, or a tree. During an earthquake, you see that this whole block is gonna shift to the right. So what'll happen is going to shift at least in this direction. So what'll happen is that tree that you're staring at in an earthquake might move so that it's here. So for you looking across the fault, it looks like that tree moved to the right. So that's why it's called a right lateral strike slip fault. It doesn't actually matter um, what side of the fault you're standing on. So let's say you're looking here at a happy little tree over here and there's an earthquake. So you can see from the arrow that it's gonna shift in this general direction. Do, 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 do. So there's our happy little tree after the earthquake. If you're standing here and you're looking across the fault, it looks like to you, gotta twist your head here to kinda of change your orientation. It looks to you like the tree once again moved to the right. So that's why this is called a right lateral strike slip fault. Alternatively, um, you can have left lateral strike slip faults. It really is just a function of what the plates are doing. So speaking of plates, shear stress is associated with transform fault boundaries. So that is the type of plate boundary that strike slip faults are typically associated with. We will learn much more about the San Andreas fault when we get to the part of the chapter that discusses earthquakes. Here's kind of a cartoon of a strike slip fault. And once again, you can see the fault here. And there's a couple of features that are often associated with strike slip faults. One of them is what's called offset drainage. So this stream flows down this slope, right? And then it hits the, um, hits the fault. And rocks along these faults get pulverized because of the grinding motion as the rocks are kind of pulled in opposite directions. And so what'll happen is that you'll often have low-lying areas right along what's called the fault trace, where the fault intersects the surface. And so streams will change direction and flow directly in the fault, pretty much just because the um, rocks are pulverized and it can scoop the rocks out and erode them very easily. Because this is often a low-lying area, water will often accumulate there and form what are called sag ponds. Sag ponds are just low-lying areas that accumulate with water along strike slip faults. The San Andreas Fault is actually part of a much larger fault system. So the west coast of the United States is kind of crazy because this over here is a divergent plate boundary where we have a mid-ocean ridge. But then here where you see the teeth, that is a convergent plate boundary, and that ends up creating like Mount St. Helens and Mount Rainier right in through here with the Cascade Volcanoes. 
then down through Mount St. Helens, or not Mount St. Helens, down the San Andreas Fault, you can see that's where our transform fault boundary is. And that's enlarged right here, where the, you can see the San Andreas Fault, while there is one main fault, there are also a series of other long, narrow faults, um, as well as faults that kind of cross the, these um, strike slip faults at about 90 degrees. Um, that has to do with the whole geologic history of the region, but the San Andreas Fault System, relatively complex. You can see that there are some faults that are really well known, like the Hayward Fault is another example of a really well mapped um, strike slip fault along the San Andreas Fault System, um, but the uh, this portion up here is less well understood. San Andreas Fault System, of course, was part of the very famous movie, uh, San Andreas. I'm pretty sure I have a link to the, uh, so to the trailer here. One of the things about scientists is that in general, we love slash hate bad science movies. And it is hard to get much worse than San Andreas, um, this movie. So I want you to, I'm going to point out some annoying things for me as we watch this. Shaking is not over. We'll get hit again. And it's going to be a bigger monster. This is crazy. This is divergence that you see in this video clip right here. Even though this is supposed to be a transform fault boundary. The earth will literally crack open. That's also divergence, right? On the east coast. And that is madness. Paul Giamatti used to have this great career. I don't know what happened. This is a great bad science movie. It's fun to watch and throw popcorn at the screen. But like, here's a tsunami that's hitting San Francisco. The Hoover Dam breaks. Like, there's a whole new plate that forms in this movie. Tsunamis are only associated with convergent plate boundaries. This is the scene where the rock in a boat goes up and over a tsunami wave, which is crazy <laughs> and fake. <laughs> anyway, it is a fun movie to watch. Um, and annoy the people you watch it with because it is so very fake anyway but a good time all right so that is another example uh so that's a brittle deformation those are the three types of faults that form as a result of brittle deformation um so another thing that can form as a result of brittle deformation are features called joints um joints this is actually a really cool picture of devil's post pile which i've never been to but soon someday um joints are when there are fractures in rocks but there's no movement that's the big difference between joints and faults joints no movements faults you have measurable movements a lot of times you'll find joints in parallel groups like you do here except that this actually formed from the cooling of a lava flow and the lava flow twisted a little bit here so these columnar joints are a little twisted this is a picture from Letchworth State Park in New York State. Um, it's called the Grand Canyon of the East. Uh, it's not really the Grand Canyon of anything, but it's pretty cool. Um, if you look down at the shale layers here, you can actually see joints. So joints, again, are just when you have cracks and rocks, there's no real offset. But do you see like these straight lines here in the shale? Shale very often will break into these straight line fractures. Those are joints. I really need to stop with this pointer today. I apologize. Um, so that's one example of joint sets. Um, the reason people care about joint sets, like for example, the jointing that results in the creation of Bryce Canyon National Park in Utah, is that chemical weathering, because water will move along joints, there'll be a lot of chemical weathering along joints. So you certainly don't want to build a house 
on rocks with a whole lot of joints in the bedrock underneath because um, the bedrock will weather more quickly. We also care about them though, because minerals can be found along joints. Cause remember water will, groundwater, which is full of minerals, can move along any crack in a rock. So a lot of times you'll have minerals that will form right within these joints and then you can mine the minerals from those locations. Um, you can have arches that are created from joints. Specifically, arches are usually found in sandstone. These are pictures from Arches National Park. And we've talked about this a little bit before, but um, we talked about it with weathering. So again, joints are locations where there will be weathering. So this is in that same fault zone that we started talking about faults with. Um, so you can have fractures in rock and it'll produce features like this eventually. So these are called fins. Fins are created when there's weathering along joints and it rounds out those joints. So it creates these long, narrow fins that kind of look like a dorsal fin on a dolphin or a shark, I guess. Um, and in Arches National Park, there's a soft rock underneath that rock erodes away and the fin will begin to collapse and which will eventually open up into an arch then weathering will continue to occur mostly because of wind but a little bit of water sometimes in this desert environment too and eventually those arches will thin and over time can break um, so again all of that occurred because of weathering along joints um, sometimes basalt will cool as a lava flow and will form what are called columnar joints um, because they form into these natural columns. These are some students in Yellowstone National Park um, several years ago now. So you can see sort of the scale of these columnar joints. This is a lava flow that's probably about 30 feet high or so. Um, this is Devil's Tower National Monument, which is 867 feet high. Um, this picture is very deceptive. I promise this student is not like 100 feet tall, um, but he is very tall. But you can see the columnar joints on Devil's Tower. That's also in Wyoming. Here are some of my students. Um, and actually that's Professor Tierney, if you take chemistry at all at MCC. And these are some of those columnar joints that have fallen down along the base of Devil's Tower right here. Um, so this is an old student, Mary, and that's Professor Tierney. And these are giant columns that have fallen from Devil's Tower. So you can see that the scale of them is much bigger than it was at Yellowstone. And that's because it's a bigger sort of lava flow. These are much smaller joints. These are found in Shenandoah National Park in Virginia. Um, here we have students who are sitting on some of those columnar joints. And you, so you can see there's a much smaller, this is a much smaller lava flow too. Um, so columnar joints are naturally, they naturally form as basalt cools. And it's kind of like a cookie and that these fractures form because everything is contracting down and the center of these columnar joints cools last. It's kind of like the gooey center of a, of a chocolate chip cookie as it's cooking. And that's what is left behind. And that is what I want you to know about structural geology. So to kind of summarize, we talked about deformation as being a change in the size, the shape, or the orientation of rocks. Deformation can occur when rocks bend, and that's called ductile deformation. And there are four folds that are associated with ductile deformation. Um, there is there are anticlines, synclines, domes, and basins. Uh, anticlines and synclines are important compressional folds. Um, domes and basins can occur because of a variety of um, tectonic stresses or just environment. So if rocks don't bend, rocks can break, and that's called brittle deformation. Um, and brittle deformation results in the creation of either faults or joints. So when you're identifying a fault to determine what type of fault you're looking at and what stress and then therefore what plate boundary is associated, you want to be able to identify the hanging wall, which is the block on the top of a fault, as opposed to the foot wall, which is the block along the bottom of the fault. And depending on the movement of the hanging wall, you can determine if a fault is a normal fault, if the hanging wall moves down, a reverse fault if the hanging wall moves up. If you have a vertical fault where there's offset, but there's absolutely no hanging wall or foot wall because the entire fault is just one um, sort of vertical break in the earth, then you're looking at strike slip faults. Normal faults are associated with tensional stress and divergent boundaries, reverse faults, compressional stress and convergent boundaries, strike slip faults with shear stress and transform boundaries. So you're gonna have some time now to experiment and kind of play around with some of these ideas in an assignment.
Have fun.